and welcome back to another episode of The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, the show where I, the curator, discuss my personal favorite show of all time, personal favorite franchise of all time, Doctor Who. And we are at the start of a brand new month today, and with that comes a brand new theme. Now, full disclosure, because I always love my transparency whenever I'm doing this show, uh, this wasn't originally supposed to be the main topic of today's episode. I had a different idea in mind uh, because I think my philosophy when making this show is if a certain month has more than four Mondays in it, case in point, I'm doing more than four shows in that month. So I always have my structure of Week one, classic. Week two, modern. Week three, expanded uh, universe. Week four, wrap things up. And if there is a five, uh, if there's a fifth week, I find some other topic to uh, fill in that slot. That is exactly what I had planned to do uh, for the episode that I'm recording right now. Unfortunately, the episode that was supposed to be recorded uh, two days ago. Uh, had uh, had fallen through because my guest unfortunately couldn't make it. So we're just jumping straight into the next topic, and uh, it's, it's just going to be uh, a loss on my a perfect record. I lost one week out of the uh, the show that I've uh, been doing for the past year, and uh, thankfully my good friend stepped in to. Uh... Okay, the show's canceled. the The guest is the, the guest just had to drop out. I'm sorry. It's just gonna be me here uh, talking about uh, my my Pokemon collection. Yeah, the guest I hold on, uh, kicked him out. Yeah. So uh, that bit of joke aside, uh, the ever the prankster soda. I was gonna be so so oh, humble and nice and say good <laughs> things about you. How you graciously stepped in to help me uh, make this episode today, but you know what? Now I can do this. <laughs> All right. uh, well, you gave, you gave me the perfect opportunity there when you said you, there goes your perfect record. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. And uh, as I. One another thing that I forgot to do was change the layout of uh, the names here today. Um, as we uh, tend to do every week on this show, we have our weekly birthday segment. However, uh, due to certain things that have happened uh, at very late last year that have sort of affected uh, the... Um, production of episodes uh, early this year uh, we sort of I sort of missed a week and therefore missed a week with uh, the birthdays and that is really what what I had why I had planned to do a different episode on the um, uh, on the fifth week of the month to sort of finally get myself all caught up with the list of birthdays that I've missed so instead I just decided to just combine the two weeks into one so we're not counting birthdays for for a full week we are counting birthdays for two weeks now namely from the 24th of january all the way up to the 6th of february which is when this episode is supposed to uh, go live so this is going to be a an, an unusually long list but i think i managed to fill it up with enough uh, really good and fun and interesting people all around. Now, on the 25th, first uh, guy that, to open our list for today is Mr. Ian Collier. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name. Uh, he played Stuart Hyde in The Time Monster. However, he was later recast as Omega in the fifth doctor episode arc of infinity and he later reprised the role of omega in the omega centered um big finish uh audio release also with the fifth doctor and he also played a couple of other minor roles on big finish hmm. as well now also on the 25th we have um tom hopper 
he was in one episode. He was definitely was kind of the definition of a one-off character in the eleventh hour, which is mostly remembered for this line right here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, but uh, me and Soda both discussed this uh, off camera, and we kind of decided uh, to actually keep him on today's list because he then later blew up and became a much bigger, known, well-known mm -hmm. character actor, primarily from the uh, the Umbrella Academy, which we both uh, love. It's a great show. <laughs> it's a, it's really good. Yeah. And uh, you're going to see one more uh, person who only had like a minor role in Doctor Who, but then obviously is a much bigger, much more known character, actor, or actress. And I'd say bigger than Tom Hooper. Tom definitely, Hooper. yes. Definitely, yeah. yes. But uh, also on the 25th, Mr. I love this guy. Christopher Ryan, not to be confused with Christopher Robin. Do you know uh, who he played in uh, Doctor Who, Mr. Soda? Not a clue off the top of my head. Okay, well, first of all, this is, this is the one that actually surprised me. He played Lord Keeve in the sixth Doctor story, The Trial of a Time Lord, the character sort of responsible for Perry's departure. However, Ooh. in the modern series... He played General Stahl of the 10th Sontaran Battle Fleet, known as Stahl the Undefeated. He is the on-screen Sontaran in the Sontaran Stratagem and the Poison Sky. He also then later played a different Sontaran in the Pandorica Opens, and he also played two uh, or more characters on Big Finish. Gotcha. Uh, most of, yeah, he mainly, mainly plays Sontarans. He's got the, the Sontaran voice for it, but he's mainly played the character of uh, Ston in the uh, Pat and Oster gang Big Finish box sets. Basically, they have this... You gotta listen to it to, to believe it. They have this... The anti Pat and Oster gang called the Bloomsbury Bunch, where it's a human, a Sontaran, and a Silurian. But the, the, the human guy is in a same-sex relationship with the Sontaran guy. Like it, it's it's great. Okay. It's like I said, you have to check it out to to uh, to appreciate uh, the greatness. Uh, on the twenty sixth, finally moving away from the twenty fifth, we have Mr. Uh, Roy Purcell. Uh, everything okay there? Oh yeah, yeah. My mom was muttering to herself. I thought she was trying to talk to me. <laughs> okay, well, muttering to oneself is the best way to spend an afternoon. Uh, mm. So yeah, Mr. Roy. Purcell, uh, he played chief, the chief prison officer, officer of powers in The Mind of Evil, but then he later uh, came back as the president of the High Council in The Three Doctors. It's so, it's a minor role, but it's somehow related to the topic that we're about to talk about today. So I yeah. decided to keep you on the list. On the 27th, Mr. Alan Cummings. Obviously, he, he's, he's probably mostly known for, be, uh, for people as playing um, Nightcrawler in the X-Men movies. Uh, to me personally, he was uh, Fluke from the Spy Kids movies. He was also Loki in Son of the Mask. That's yep. a bit random. Moulin Rouge. Yeah, uh, he, Spice he, World. He, he, yeah, he's known for a lot of things. But as seen in this picture, he was in the Witchfinders, the Jodie Whittaker era episode. And he honestly, he really stole the show. Oh, like, yeah. he really stole that episode. Good to know. Big time. On the 29th, met the lovely and beautiful Miss Catherine Stewart. Speaking of the Pattern Oster Gang, mm -hmm. she played uh, Jenny Flint on the Pattern Oster Gang, both on the television show and on Big Finish. She also had a couple of other roles in Big Finish, but she's mainly known as Jenny Flint, yeah, yeah. the love interest of Madame Vastra. Uh, from the uh, Paternoster gang. On the 30th, we have, and weirdly enough, I could not find a picture of this guy, not on the website where I get the um, birthdays from, and I couldn't find a picture of this guy on Google Images. Uh, hold on, let me just check out the name so I don't get it wrong. Uh, Mr. Peter Brachaki. Brachaki. Uh, Peter Brachaki, the designer of the TARDIS interior. Mm -hmm. He was the designer for the first two episodes of the show, on uh, an earthly child, and obviously uh, the uh, the cave of skulls. But I mean, he, he's the guy that designed the TARDIS. Like, 
you cannot top that in the no. world world of sci-fi. Am I well, right? There's very, there's very few things sci-fi, that can sci-fi television. Sci-fi very- television, I should say. But also on the also on the thirtieth, Miss Daphne Ashbrook, who played uh, the doctor in uh, the Dr. movie, Doctor Grace Holloway in uh, the nineteen sixty sixty yep. nineteen ninety six TV movie. Also on the thirtieth, this is the one I mentioned earlier, who was a minor minor role, also in the eleventh hour, but then obviously much more 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 well known for other stuff. Olivia Coleman. Yes, Academy right. Award winning actress Olivia Coleman. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of brought it up to Soda as a joke, but then we both just sort of discussed that she's got to be here. Right? Yeah, she's, she's, she's easily the biggest name on here. <laughs> she's more than earned her yeah. place. And uh, speaking of biggest names here, uh, in the role of Doctor Who, maybe not, but on the the first of January, sorry, the first of February. My bad. I miss her so much. Mm-hmm. I, I I love this woman dearly. The wonderful Miss Elizabeth Sladen, Sarah Jane Smith, the best companion. I, I'm gonna. I'm I'm getting tear teared up just uh, thinking about her. So let's move on to uh, February third. Miss Mary- in love with her. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's try to move past Soda's comment there and move on to to February third, Mister Warwick Davis. Yes, I love Warwick Davis. He I is did, the best. I, I did I did tell you off off screen that there's gonna gonna be one name on here oh, that's gonna really make you giddy. Okay, but um, before you okay before you continue, if any of anybody watching this or even you, I know you, you weren't a big fan of the of the movie Willow, but I do recommend you go watch this. It is the behind the making of documentary for the TV series. Um, Warwick Davis is by far the best thing of that. I, I highly recommend go watching it. It's too funny. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll I'll. I'll... I don't want to like to watch behind the scenes of stuff I didn't watch. Fair, if, if, fair. Get if my meaning, but may, maybe I'll check that one out. But uh, on the fourth, here's the one that really makes me giddy because it's one of my absolute favorite characters from all of Doctor Who. Character I wish they'd bring back on the TV show at some point. It's Peter Butterworth. The meddling the monk. monk. <laughs> yeah, the me- I love the meddling monk. And unfortunately, he only appeared in two serials, seven episodes in total, but he- the guy made an impact. So and- let me let me let me let me ask you this because I, I'm assuming this is your, that was your personal take on it. But as somebody who's well versed in more the the hoop culture than I am, how how is the meddling monk received? Is is it the general consensus similar to your feeling about him? Like he should have been in more? Or was it like, or, or or like, what's the deal? I don't know if specifically him is as beloved as I like him to be, but the Rufus Hound version on Big Finish, people love the guy as the monk. But uh, okay, and, but so they love the so, they do love the character. Okay. So like, there's <coughs> there, there, bless you. There's definitely a demand for this character in this universe. I'll I'll say that. What the hell is wrong? Are you allergic to monks all of a sudden? <laughs> no, I just started to sneeze. <laughs> there's sneezing, and then there's what you just did. Like, <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I got, I gotta sneeze. I gotta power, power sneeze to the point where I've seen spots. Oof, uh, I hate it when that happens. But uh, yeah. what, I mean, what I don't ha- hate is, when, but but what I don't hate is when we finally reach the end of the birthday section. With our last person on the 5th of February, Mr. Michael Sheen. Yes. Of course, he played the uh, the, the voice of House in The Doctor's Wife. But, I mean, aside from that, he, it's Michael Sheen. So, yes, David Tennant's other half. Yeah, the other half. The other half of David Tennant. Uh, they okay. both... Well, what? I was gonna say, you know what? When the, they're gonna be, when they're old men, they're gonna be the next Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. That is a great comparison. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I love that. So, for the incredibly long and wonderful list of people we had today, 
Thank you all. We quite literally could not do this without you. Mm -hmm. So now, why do you say we get down to the main business of talking about the main topic of today's show? This thing right here. This big red dot right in the middle of space. What? This big red dot right in the middle of space. Right in the middle of this bit, yeah. The planet Gallifrey and the constellation of Kasturbus in the Mater's Spiral. So, uh, which I've got several different directions we could go here, uh, but I suppose we'll just start off with the basics. What do you know about classic era Gallifrey before we uh, get on to talk? Um, yeah, but, uh, I, I, I knew that it was featured quite a bit more than it was in New Who, for sure. Um, I knew that an entire season was dedicated to it with the Sixth Doctor. Um, I knew of certain characters like the Vale Yard and Romana. And of course, the master and, and what have you. And I, I knew the name Rassalon. Um, but other than that, I hadn't seen a serial until today, actually, the day of recording, based on 50 Suggestion. I did see the Deadly Assassin one, parts one through four. Um, I rather enjoyed it. And like I said to him uh, when I was finishing it up, uh, oh my God, the Time Lords are bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the point. There's, there, an allegory for like British colonialism, you know. Yeah, way. well, not just that. I also saw some aspects of uh, well, Americana in there, like the whole rewrite history, you know, and the truth. That's to the victors go the spoils. Um, and that only gets worse the more they appear on the show. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. Um, so when did they first appear? I'm glad you asked because I was about to get to that. So uh. Obviously, other than the Doctor himself and Susan, which, if I'm being honest, both accounts are kind of questionable, the only other Time Lord character seen in the show in its infancy, in its early days, is the aforementioned meddling monk, mm -hmm. played by the wonderful late, great Peter Butterworth. By the way, Peter Butterworth's son, David Butterworth, he's the guy that introduced Peter... Uh, Peter Davison to his wife. Like he was close friends with both of them in uh, from drama school or something like that. And he's the one that introduced the two of them together. So he was now known to the doctor in a good way this time. Yeah, in a, in, a, in a good way. Now, for clarification, that that is not uh, Georgia Tennant's mother. Oh, okay. that, that, is, that is he. He's got a different, uh, he's got two boys from. Uh, with, with that woman and Georgia Tennant was born from a uh, different woman earlier. But uh, yeah, just complicated, messy lives of celebrities, ladies and gentlemen. But yeah, so the monk is the only other character from, uh, sorry, the only other member of the Doctor's species that we've ever seen in the show. Another character with a TARDIS of his own. However, the name Time Lord does not appear until the last serial of season six. Really? The final, yeah, the final serial that features Pitt Patrick Troughton as the main doctor where the, oh. where the name Time Lord first ever appears. For something that's so entwined with who doc to the doctor, is he, that's kind of surprising. Actually, it's not. Because when you really think about it, a lot of the, the, the parts of the character, especially in the, the show's early days, was to keep the doctors a secret. Like, okay, that's fair. A lot, a lot of the mystique, and over the years, they slowly, emphasis on slowly, started to leak, sort of, sort of drop in hints towards the Doctor's past. And gotcha. even though we got a massive, massive reveal in recent memory with the Timeless Child storyline, opinions may vary on that one. But we still, there's so much we still do not know about the Doctor's life. Uh -huh. So. It's actually not that surprising that we got that reveal in season six, and the name Gallifrey wasn't even mentioned until season eleven, really? which was John Pertwee's final season. But we're not quite there yet. But in the end of uh, Patrick Troughton's final serial, The War Games, we get introduced to, to obviously the name Time Lord for the first time, as well as another time, as well as another member of the Doctor species, a Time Lord by the name of the War Chief. And later in that same episode, we get introduced to proper, true, official Time Lords from 
the planet that will later become known to us as Gallifrey in the form of these three, which were given the inauspicious names of First Time Lord, Second Time Lord, and Third Time Lord. How original. Time. Yeah. Now, obviously, years and years later, they were... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Through retcon and through other storylines and other and other stuff, they were sort of they were given the names Adelphi, Sokra, and Goth. More on him later. But, oh no way! Yeah, the the guy in the middle that's the same actor. Oh, so damned. yeah, so they sort of retroactively gave they were like you know what? Yeah, it's the same character. Who cares? I like that. Yeah, he didn't regenerate. Who know? Who cares? Yeah. Now. These three characters, what is so significant about them is they were the uh, main figures in the tribunal that uh, sort of tried the warlords at the end of the war games. Uh, uh, they, they found uh, the warlords guilty of crimes against time and crimes against the universe. And after a brief attempt to escape fr from the, uh, the warlords to escape, the time lords found them unanimously guilty and sentenced their entire planet to a time loop Ooh. that they cannot escape from, and the warlord himself and his henchmen were erased from time itself. Basically, it will be like they never even existed. Oh, that's harsh. So, right off the bat, first time you get to in introduce to these guys, you immediately get introduced to how powerful the time lords are and how ruthless and brutal they can be yeah, they no, want and immediately after that came the doctor's trial. So like after they it. after that's what that's what they did to the warlords, they now have the honor of putting the doctor himself on trial for get for crimes against Gallifrey for, for the the main crime of non-interference, which is what the doctor has yeah, been. I was gonna say, why did you like uh as someone not well versed in who outside of like you characters are, why was he on trial? Well, the obvious he stole a TARDIS and uh, ran away and broke the Time Lord rule of non interference. But well, we know that was all Kara's idea. Shut up. <laughs> no, the, the, the idea to run away wasn't her. I'm just kidding. He came, he, he wanted to leave. I know. Because apparently, know. He, he apparently he saw. A, a vision of the hybrid, but that we'll save that for the next episode. But after running away from uh, from Gallifrey and he type forty, he stole in type forty Tardis. He started interfering and meddling in the lives of other um, alien alien races, or as the Time Lords view them, the lesser races, and therefore uh, they, they view that as a as a breach of their uh, most secret rule of non interference. But the Doctor made a case for himself for why his interferences were necessary and why the, and that there is evil in the universe that must be fought and the time lords were swayed by it they were they, they didn't actually uh, decide that, uh, uh, to absolve him of, of uh, his uh, charges but they they sort of reach an agreement that the doctor does have a part to play in the balance between good and evil in the universe outside Gallifrey now still that is disputed by some people whether or not the trial itself was taking place on Gallifrey itself or mm -hmm. on a Time Lord ship orbiting the, the Warlord's planet. Still kind of disputed because we never actually get to see much of it. May they mainly took advantage of the fact that it was a black and white episode, so a lot of the, the it's just black background and you don't really see much of anything, but some people do assume that that uh, trial was taking place on Gallifrey, that the Time Lords hijacked the, tar the Doctor's TARDIS from the time vortex and brought it and forced him to land on Gallifrey. Hmm. Being that as it may, there really doesn't isn't much from that uh, area that we do see. But what we do see is that there's this uh, long line of Tardises that they bring uh, the Doctor's companions at the time, Jamie McCrimmon and Zoe Harriet, through a Tardis and send them back to their proper places in the in the timeline and wipe their memories of the Doctor. Oh and shit! <laughs> that sucks for Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Time Lords! Shame on you, Time Lords! Spoilers, Goth got what he fucking deserves. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers. Now that I know. <laughs> spoilers. But, uh, yeah, so after that, they uh, decided to exile the Doctor 
to planet Earth in either the 1970s or the 1980s. Again, once once again, disputed endlessly by so many different people, but that, that is a discussion that will never end. But another part of the, you know, the sentence was a forced regeneration into his third incarnation. So after spending a couple of months on Earth in exile, uh, the, the... I honestly don't know if I should just drop the bomb on you, but uh, yeah, the drop time away. was... Decided. Okay, so the time was kind of decided that uh, the doctor needs a proper adversary to keep him busy during his exile. <coughs> so they released the master. Is from that the how the master came about? Yeah, so the the master wa was serving time for crimes against uh, the universe in the Time Lord Maximum Security Prison known as Shada. And they just decided oh. to release him so that the doctor will have someone to play with during his exile. During okay. which time... What? That's crazy. But, yeah. sorry, Shada, that's not the um, Douglas Adams one, is it? Where have I heard that name before? Pretty sure that was written by Douglas Adams. Yeah, where have I heard that name before? Pretty sure, yeah, that, that was the Douglas Adams Okay. You want to look it up while, while I'm yeah, 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 yeah. So during which time, uh, and actually you might want you might want to watch this. So during which time the third Doctor was visited by Adelphi in his new incarnation, which looked like this. Ah, uh, very Chaplin esque. Yeah, an invisible TARDIS who just showed up out of nowhere to warn the Doctor that the Master was running around, conveniently leaving out the part of him uh, of him letting the Master out. To play, but sounds about no, right. For the time, time lord. lord, yeah, that is the, the time lords. Now, and yes, it is indeed Shada. Yeah, the, the, the uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Douglas Shada Adams wrote, I think, two episodes, two serials, and I'm pretty sure one of them was Shada. So yeah, this uh, they did the animated restorations, of course, and I think I've seen a book. The book I've got the novel. That's right, I got it on um, digital copy. Yeah. Despite the fact that the, uh, the episode itself never actually aired, there are countless versions of that story mm -hmm. for people to enjoy. Why didn't it air? Uh, there was a production strike at the BBC, so they didn't get to film the last oh. three serials or something like that. That's harsh. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But uh, during uh, this whole galactic yo-yo of the Doctor... Solving problems on Earth, fighting the Master, and also being sent by the Time Lords on various missions to other planet. We were we, the audience are introduced to what is known as the CIA, yeah. also known as the Celestial Intervention Agency. Basically, a secret society of Time Lords that run that actually do allow themselves to break the Time Lord rule of non-interference and actually do interfere in certain events that they believe is hindering what the Time Lords refer to as the prime timeline. Like, things that they deem are not supposed to happen, they send agents for uh, from the CIA, the Celestial, the Celestial Intervention Agency, to change certain events in history to make sure that everything goes smoothly according to the, the way that the Time Lords want the universe to go. Hmm. And during this time, they sent the Doctor on numerous different missions to uh, different other other planets in uh, the universe, uh, most notably uh, the planet Paladon, as well as the Doomsday uh, Affair. The Doomsday Weapon Affair, sorry. On Uxarius, I believe, where, where this guy uh, was the uh, the main president at the time. Now, uh, going going back and forth between Earth and other planets, eventually the Time Lords decided to lift the Doctor's exile on Earth after the Omega Crisis, which involved three Doctors, not just one, but three Doctors, with his first and second incarnation being pulled from their timelines to assist the third Doctor on Earth 
deal with the return of Omega. More on him later. But mm. after that, the, the time was decided that the doctor has uh, served his time on Earth and they decided to give him a new dematerialization circuit and allowed him to resume his travels through uh, uh, time and space. Later in, in, uh, later in life, obviously, the doctor then uh, regenerated into his fourth incarnation and uh, continued to travel sort of independently through time until we get introduced to this character right here, which in later years, in, sorry, in more recent years, I should say, was then retroactively given the name of Chancellor Valley as a Time Lord oh. from, from what? I was going to say, oh, okay. Like I was, sorry, sorry. That's it's, it's okay. If you have any questions, feel feel free to stop me. But yeah, so this guy Chancellor Valiez was a Time Lord from Gallifrey's relative future, and I'm going to say relative. I mean, it's future for the fir fourth Doctor mm -hmm. <coughs> coming back from an an attempted invasion by the Daleks into Gallifrey itself to try and warn the Doctor about a time somewhere in the in the far future where the Daleks become the, uh, the superior dominant beings of the universe. And so they plucked the Doctor, Sarah Jane, and Harry Sullivan from their uh, uh, time in, from their places in time and space and sent them to Scarrow in the very final days of the Thousand Year War between the, the Khalids and the Thals and give the Doctor and his companions a mission to either... St prevent the Daleks from ever developing or alter their <coughs> evolution. <coughs> yeah, I, shocking, I know. Uh, so to either prevent the Daleks from ever evolving or tamper with their evolution to make them a little less aggressive. An act that, while seemingly good-natured at the time, eventually in years to come was seen by many as the first stone thrown in the conflict that would eventually become known as the last great time war between the Daleks and the Time Lord. So, really? Yeah, the origins of the time war can be traced back to this moment right here. Wow. But there's so much other so much other story going on in between that that it's just put a pin in that and remember that uh, for another time. Yeah, no problem. Now, as, about a season and a half later, that is when uh, the Deadly Assassin episode happens, freshly off of uh, dropping off Sarah Jane in, uh, excuse me, Aberdeen. <laughs> uh, the Doctor is called back to Gallifrey. He's starting to have, to have uh, a precognitive, uh, precognitive vision about the future, where he sees a potential future assassination of the president, President Pandad the Fourth. Which obviously that that was when uh, it leads into the uh, the deadly assassin, the episode that you watched, and that was properly the first time we actually got to see Gallifrey. Really? Yeah, sorry, Gallifrey, the planet itself, in its full might. As I mentioned, really? with with the tribunal, it's still disputed if it was actual Gallifrey, but officially, see, yeah, we do see hints of. The Celestial Innovation Agency, uh, they're based all throughout the Third Doctor's era with, as I mentioned, the uh, the Doomsday Affair, the Three Doctors, and I believe Day of the Daleks. But seeing actual proper Gallifrey, the Citadel, the inside of the Panopticon, and like the main chamber halls and the High Council, all of that was given to us in the episode, rather the four-part serial, the Deadly Assassin. Now, before I move on, while I let, let, give my voice some time to rest, what did you think about the episode itself, Mr. Soda? So, like I said to you in the green room, I, I really liked the serial overall, although I will say part three was the weakest for me. Um, not because I didn't understand what was going on or whatever. It's just it felt the most out of place. I'm not used to seeing the Doctor and that kind of combat, and especially being drowned at the end. That was a little weird. Um but overall, I like the characters of uh, I like I like some of the gala the Time Lords in this serial. Um, I thought it was pretty cool to see because it's the first time I ever watched anything outside of like little clips. The first time I ever watched a serial with the old Time Lords, and 
Um, no, I thought I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it felt like Sherlock Holmes. And uh, no, I, I, I really, I, I dug it. I dug it. And it was my first time seeing a Tom Baker serial as well. And watching it, I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. I get it. See, like, that's why he had a presence about him that I was like, I, I bought it right away. See, that's why I've been trying for years to get you to watch the classic series because you can watch clips and reviews and, and read stuff on, on Wikipedia all you like, but actually seeing it and experiencing it for yourself, yeah. completely different thing. Am I right? Well, I, I agree. Yeah. Now that I've seen, now that I've, I've watched us, like, because I, I, full disclosure, I, when I did start my classic who I got sidetracked by other things. I actually haven't been able to pick up. There was just rest too much wrestling involved. Uh, that 90 show came out, all that stuff, but it's just like, okay, now I do buy into that, that there's more to it than what you see. Yeah. More than meets the eye. Yeah. Or in other words, there's more to see that can ever be seen more to do that can ever be done. Oh, there it is. <laughs> you hear that, Ben? He yeah, did that it. That one's for you, Ben. That one's for you. Now, uh, Soda, would you want me? There. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. I could just imagine him with that giant smile yeah. on his face in that moment. Uh, now, Mr. Soda, would you believe me if I told you that that serial that you just watched was absolutely 100% hated when it first aired. Not surprised. <laughs> I don't really? know why. And I'll tell you why. Because for a lot of people, it changed their entire understanding of Time Lord society up until that point. Oh. Because again, before that, we didn't really get to know that much about Time Lords. They were this mysterious, almost godlike <laughs> beings that somehow manipulated stuff about the Doctor's life from, as I mentioned, the uh, the war games and through the Celestial Intervention Agency. There's the one random uh, Chancellor Valia's appearance in Genesis of the Daleks. But yeah, up until that point, the, the Time Lords, for the most part, have been complete unknowns hmm. to a lot of people. But that episode really does, while it does a lot to further the lore of the Time Lords and further the lore of Gallifrey. A lot of people did not like it. And in a way, a weird way, obviously not quite as extreme, but it was kind of the timeless children of the 70s at Got the time you. because how it completely flipped the whole script yeah. on its head. Well, I'm but, assuming now people are more receptive of it, but that's because they already have the history of the, the Time Lords yeah, nowadays people yeah. love this episode, but this episode was absolutely hated on its initial release. Well, I did read one thing because I was uh, so I was curious about something. So I went on the IMDb page, and I was on the one for part three, and it said that uh, the ending was a big controversial deal. I was gonna get get to that yeah. because with w- him goth drowning the doctor in the swamp at mm-hmm. the end of part three. Obviously, if you watch the episode on Breadbox right now, I'm assuming the final shot you see is just Goth going, you're beaten, Doctor, you surrender, or whatever it is you say. Yeah, I think that's what it was. In the original broadcast, the final shot you see is the shot of Tom Baker with his face fully submerged underwater, choking to death, and that is how they chose to end the episode. <clears throat> and you have to excuse me because there's uh, I forgot her name. But there was this big important. I'm, I'm looking that up right now. I think her name was Margaret Whitehead. I'm just double- pretty sure. Yeah, Margaret Whitehead did not like that episode, and that episode really, it, you can tell, they really upped the violence <laughs> in this episode significantly. Yeah. Curiously, this was an episode before Leela was introduced, but that's beside Sorry. the point. But Mary Whitehouse. Epi- Mary Whitehouse. Yeah. Mary Whitehouse. Um, yeah. Mary Whitehouse. Uh, for those who don't know, was somebody who liked to stick her nose in places that didn't belong, quite frankly. Um, but she took it upon herself. A time Lord. She was yeah. a time lady. Pretty much. No, she took it upon herself basically to be the moral compass of, of Britain at the time and was one of those um, one of those ladies that ch- ch- tried to censor everybody uh, based on her political, or, or not political beliefs, but on her own personal views. Um, just one of those dumbasses. <laughs> I don't really have much, much things, nice things to say about people like that. She was basically Margaret Thatcher before Margaret Thatcher. 
I'd say worse, actually. Worse. Wow. Okay. I'd say worse. Yeah, because because the whole thing about uh, about her is was censorship. Mm. See, like she was trying to censor things that just weren't up to her own personal tastes. <clears throat> now, I'll, I I did say earlier that the episode Genesis of the Daleks and uh, the intervention of Chancellor Valiers can be seen by a lot of people as like the first spark that eventually led the massive powder keg that was the Time War. Mary Whitehouse disliking this episode and the amount of excessive violence in this episode <coughs> was really the, the first step that eventually yeah. a decade and a half later led to the show's cancellation in 1989. Oh? Yeah. The, the, because the that episode was a change in a lot of different ways. Like the, this really was the first stepping stone, the first, like I said, the first spark yeah. that lit up the fuse that eventually got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually led to this show's cancellation in 1989. Now, now that we're all caught up to uh, the time of the deadly assassin, I'm, I'm choosing to stay away from the invasion of time because that's another episode I, I wanted you to watch before going to this episode, but since you uh, didn't have the time to, then let's just break away and... Uh, yeah, I will say I do know the ending because we did discuss it not that long ago. Shit. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one. But Shut I just want to break away, and for the final couple of uh, minutes of the, of the episode, let's just spend some time talking about Time Lord history and Time Lord culture as we know it today. I will so, say that's beautiful architecture. Yeah, I, I, I wish we got to see more of that. Yeah. Now, obviously, the budget did not really allow for it in the classic series, but you would assume with the bigger budget of the modern series, we get to see more of Gallifrey, and then, oh, whoops, Gallifrey was destroyed in a war. Whoopsie. But you know. then... Yeah, but then obviously, Steven, <clears throat> and this is like it drives me crazy sometimes. Like, see, Russell D. Davies comes on on the scene, destroys Gallifrey. There is no Gallifrey anymore. Stephen Moffat takes over, brings Gallifrey back, and we still don't see that much of Gallifrey at all. But he brings Gallifrey back in the 50th anniversary. Chris Chibnall takes over. Gallifrey is destroyed again. No Gallifrey. Like. So now that Russell T is back, is he going to bring Gallifrey back again? I hope so, because I'm not going to lie. I want to see more. After seeing what I just saw, I want with the Deadly Assassin. I want to see more stories like that on Gallifrey in modern Who. Me too. Gallifrey has such a rich history and beautiful architecture, great culture, and like seriously, <laughs> I, have, I have notes here. Like Gal the stuff about Gallifrey is very very deep, and but but unfortunately we don't really get we, we what we see on the TV show is but a fraction mm -hmm. of Gallifrey's full potential that was explored in comics and in novels and most more recently in Big Finish. Yeah. Like we didn't but, get a lot of it in the end of time, which would have been cool to see more of Timothy Dalton. We didn't really get a lot. Of, we like, we got more in the fiftieth, but still not enough. Mm -hmm. I get, yeah, I mean, we saw them interact, kind of, but it was all over Intercom. I would have loved to have seen the Doctor <coughs> interact with the Time Lords, but alas, so I, I really do hope we get, especially if they're doing, if they're doing like this whole Marvel verse type thing with Doctor Who. I do hope we get that. <clears throat> yeah, that that is one I wish. What why I wish they bring Gallifrey back, but I'm I'm just really tired of this idea that. The new, the incoming showrunner undoes what the previous showrunner did. Like, yeah, uh, a lot of people yeah. I've, I've been seeing online, and understandably so, a lot of people are hoping that Russell T is going to do away with the whole timeless child storyline. You know what? I say expand on it. Well, let me just double down on what you just said. Russell T actually liked that idea. He's, yeah, he, he, he said that the execution could have been done better, but he actually liked that idea. Yeah. So did Stephen, and so did Stephen Moffat and so did Mark Gaddis. So you know yeah, I'm not gonna lie, the concept isn't that bad of bad of an idea. And there's Again, it's, 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 all, it's all down to the execution. And like, there's definitely so much more with that concept of the timeless child, especially that you could explore. Yeah, and 
I'll say this, even though it's coming from me, I think what they what Stephen Moffat tried to do with Clara could have been done better. And maybe I would have liked what 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 he where he was going with that character. Yeah, again, it, the execution <clears throat> in the name of the doctor just felt so badly to me. I, and, I well, I do not despise it as much as you. I will say after the most recent when we did the most recent we watched what was that like a year ago. I will say I was able to understand your point of view more from by rewatching it. Where she, at the, after that point, she almost becomes a different character. Yeah, I I, I, I prefer I'll, I prefer Clara in the first or first season. I'll, I'll die on this hill if I must. I, I think Clara should have died in the name of the Doctor. It would have been such a better closure for that character mm -hmm. for that to happen instead of dragging this out for two more seasons, where she basically just. Out doctored the doctor, yeah. But I mean, we can drag we can get dragged into a conversation about Clara. I Osborne. would have been all right. Okay, there's one more thing on that though. I would have been all right. I think she was perfectly well suited for, um, uh, uh for you know, day of the doctor. I would have liked that to have been her last story myself. Okay, I mean, again, mm -hmm. I think <coughs> it would have worked better if she died in name of the doctor, but that's. Water under the bridge at this point. So, going back into to Gallifrey for a second, or time through the stream, as I guess as they, as they would say. More, more, more what? Or time through the stream. Yeah, time, yeah, time through the stream. So obviously, Gallifrey is a planet with, according to Rassilon, a billion of years of Time Lord history riding on their backs. Now, obviously, in the early days of Gallifrey, it was mainly populated by, uh, by uh, primitive beings known as the Shabogans, who were obviously, of course, ruled by the primarily female uh, Pythians. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about uh, the early days of Gallifrey in the Dark Times, because that's really more of a conversation for a, in expanded media stuff, but I will touch on certain what? points. You did bring up a name that just reminded me there was something I wanted to ask you on screen because I asked you off it and I caught, I noticed it when they were talking about the sash of Rassilon. And I was like, I thought, uh, uh, wait, is there, is this like a, what is this, like a title? Like, explain that, why there's the sash of Rassilon, but then we have a Rassilon. I'm getting to that. Okay, cool. I am getting to that. <clears throat> and unfortunately, some of that you're going to have to wait a week because that's, got to do with modern day, uh, Doctor Who stuff, but in the very early days of Ross, of uh, uh, Gallifrey, as I mentioned, the Shabogans ruled over by the ma primarily male Pythians until eventually uh, Rassilon, a leader, warmonger, architect, whatever you want to call him, um, eventually led a war against the Pythians and won, banishing them from Gallifrey, but in one final... Uh, Act of revenge, the Pythians basically sterilized the Gallifreyans, meaning they could no longer have natural births on Gallifrey. The Pythians were eventually uh, banished to the nearby planet of Karn and formed what will then later become known as the Sisterhood of Karn, which obviously were then featured in The Brain of Morbius and later returned in the modern series in uh, The Night of the Doctor and more recently in... Um, Hellbent, the Peter Capaldi episode. Now, uh, following uh, following that war, uh, Rassilon sort of decided that uh, there will no there will no longer be any more natural births on Gallifrey. Instead, that new Time Lords will be woven into existence by Time Lord Looms, which essentially, and this is the shocking part, new Time Lords will be loomed, we woven into existence in adult form. From the DNA of the dead Gallifreyans who perished in the war against the Pythians. Oh. I did say prepare yourself for a shock. Now, that's, obviously, that, that's quite a lot of dead people. <laughs> yeah, and obviously in more recent uh, examples like with Day of the Doctor, the existence of children of Gallifrey seems to suggest that there is either a return to the uh, natural birth of Gallifrey or maybe they're just loomed into existence at a younger age. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> yeah, so after several, uh, several years of that, Rassilon establishes himself as president of Gallifrey and sort of helps 
advance uh, the uh, Time Lord Society further. Eventually came uh, that, that was when the idea of regeneration and time travel came along. That's uh, later on, on in the discussion. He went to war with other beings in the universe, known, known as uh, the, the, the early Gallifreyans were known as the Burgeoning Empires, went to war against other beings such as the Rachnos, the Nestines, and the, the Great Vampires. And overall, Time Lord Society, as we know it today, is primarily built upon the shoulders of three primary people, also nicknamed the Founding Fathers of Gallifrey. Are you seeing this picture, oh. by the way? Yes, yes, I am seeing it. I've always liked that design. Kind of reminds me of the Wu Tang Clan. I always see, it's sort of, especially if you've seen from from the front, it looks like a cross, sort of. Yeah, Isn't I can it? see that. A sort of weird, weirdly shaped cross. So these are the founding fathers, uh, the three founding fathers of Ta Time Lord Society: Rassilon, Omega, and the other. He seen in this picture right here. Rassilon. Why does yeah. that sound familiar? Uh, I don't know. There are a lot of other people in the world. Well, no, no, but I mean, like the name, the other. Isn't it something connected with the doctor himself? Spoilers. Okay. Okay. So, out of these three people, Rassilon, Omega, and the other, which one of the three would you like to hear about first? Well, let's go with Rassilon. It's because he was the one that, uh, you know, I had the question earlier. Yeah. So, Rassilon establishes himself. While he wasn't the first president of Gallifrey, he was considered to be the first president of the High Council of Time Lords. He established a new rule of, of uh, Time Lord on, Gal on Gallifrey itself. Uh, new um, new Time Lords will be woven into houses known known primarily as noble houses. There are all kinds of houses where where, where new uh, loomed Time Lords will be assigned assigned to and live in family groups that mainly consist of cousins. They don't they don't necessarily have fathers and um, oh. fathers sons brothers. They are primarily referred to as cousins. Do you know what this sounds like? Do you know what that sounds like to me? Camp Half Blood from the Percy Jackson series. Still have not actually gotten into that series. But no, no, I'm a big fan of the books, and to me, that's just what it reminds me of because that's what it is. The camp is comprised of every. They're all cousins. They're all related. Yeah, in a way. Sorry, but but. Again, there, 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 there's no blood there. They're loomed into yeah. existence. But no, I mean, I mean the concept of the house. It's like very Harry Potterish. It's very Harry Potterish and very yeah. Game of Thrones ish. Yeah. Like the House of Longborough, the House. It's like of a clan. Yeah, but basically like a clan, a clan of different time lords, male or female. It doesn't really matter because time lords can change gender when they regenerate. So they're gender fluid. They're gender fluid. <laughs> Yet somehow, some of these groups have sort of siblings in a way. Primarily, the Doctor and his brother, Irvin Braxia. They're they're still somehow I'm considered sorry. actual brothers. But the in this has a brother. Yeah, I just said. I already told you that a couple of episodes ago. Yes, but remember, pot smoker, short-term memory. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Dory. So <laughs> after after these time lords were loomed into existence um, in their noble houses, obviously, in this is sort of uh, stepping into some modern who stuff. But at the age of eight, they're taken away from their noble houses to the dry lands of Gallifrey and forced to, to stand to stare into the untempered schism. <laughs> Just keep swimming. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, forced to stare into the untempered schism and uh, uh, are then separated into three groups the ones that get inspired by what they see, the ones who run away, and the ones who go mad. Then, after that, they're being, they're being sorted. In, go I was ahead. Say, remember this without giving anything away. This is a big component for this. That's that's the same that's the same ceremony, correct? Yeah, I didn't okay. want to say because again, that's 
That's why I, that's why I alluded to it. I just wanted to confirm it. it's the same ceremony. That, that's that's one of my favorite things about that episode. Yeah, and and that is uh, deeping into um, modern Who stuff. But after uh, spoilers, after the after the initi initiation ceremony, they're, they're then being returned to their houses, where they're been, then being sorted into their own proper jobs or rather um, positions in Time Lord society. Some go to the military, and some go to the Time Lord Academy. Uh, and once in the academy, they're then sorted sorted into one of six pri primary chapters in uh, the Time Lord, Time Lord Academy. These chapters can also be seen as universities for oh. each uh, each of the chapters. <clears throat> Basically, just try to think of it as like the houses of uh, Hogwarts, except unlike Hogwarts, the the chapter you're sorted into. You stay there for life, and it actually does have political influence over the rest of your lives going forward. Like you, you cannot escape the chapters you're being sorted into. Like I don't like it. What? I don't like that idea. <laughs> I mean, time load society. What are you gonna do? Yeah. So there, are, as I mentioned, there are six chapters, each with their own uh, corresponding color of robes. That uh, they have, they are be being forced to wear <laughs> on official ceremonies. Uh, the Arcalian chapter, with their with their colors being Sorry, green, the Arcalian chapter, with their colors primarily being green. They're primarily a uh, chapter of uh, scientists and inventors. Uh, the Cerulean chapter, with their robes primarily being blue. The Dromian chapter, their colors primarily being silver and gray. The Petraxi chapter, with their pro color pro main colors primarily being heliotrope, the Pridonian chapter, with their main colors being crimson or orange, depend, depending on uh, the person. And the this is the one that's really the hardest to pronounce because I've never actually heard it. I've only read it. The Either the Scandalous or Sandalous. It's an S-C-E. Uh, the Sandalous uh, chapter, also known as the Forgotten chapter, with subdued colors. Basically, they're... Uh, university or other their chapter sort of kind of fell apart because they try to take more political power than they should have and sort of faded into obscurity and no one really talks about them anymore. Nice. So I have, yeah I have uh, I have a couple of pictures of different time lords and different wearing different robes here as you can see here uh, the, the different the different robes of uh, the of the main time lords who once they uh, graduate from the uh, the academy they're then being sorted into a series of different roles. Some uh, get sorted into being um, engineers, t TARDIS technicians, architects, uh, soldiers, warmongers. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like Man of Steel. I'll I'll do you one better. It sounds like the show Krypton. Okay, I haven't seen Krypton, but I believe that if they follow that same lineage. Yeah, it pretty much that. And, and again, it's, it's even further than that. It's like when, when two people, uh, this is Krypton, by the way, not, not Doctor Who, but on Krypton, when uh, two uh, Kryptonians are being chosen to sort of uh, get married, uh, or rather have babies, they take DNA from each and they sort of mold it into a future baby. Mm -hmm. There's no sex on Krypton. Th that's really how their whole society is built on. Yeah, they kind of they allude to that in Man of Steel. Like, you don't see how it came to be, but you do see the baby in the stasis and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. the show Krypton is basically was intended to be a prequel to Man of Steel before they sort of broke off and started doing their own thing. Didn't but know anyway, cool. watch Krypton, if you will, but fair warning, it ends on the mother of all cliffhangers and there's no season three. <laughs> the thing. But, yeah, so... Uh, the, the biggest one of the biggest uh, uh, positions that a time Lord can aspire to is to become a cardinal, which is basically just a member of government, the equivalent of a senator or a minister in um, the uh, in the Time Lord capital. And as you can see here, Cardinal Barusa with the uh, crimson colors of the uh, um, uh, of the Pridonian chapter. You see, you see behind them a couple of Archelians. Over here, we see some more uh, Archelians and uh, um, Pridonians. The Pridonian chapter, uh, for the most part, has produced 
more presidents than any other chapter in Gallifrey's history, namely one of which being the doctor himself. Yes. And the, yeah, the doctor being a, a time lord of the Pridonian chapter of the House of Longborough, uh, eventually uh, ascending uh, to become a president himself. But uh, yeah, we'll, you will get to that when you continue your rewatch, uh, your watching of some more Doctor Who. You got it. Because I was going to ask that, like, which house did he belong into? But you just answered. Yeah, he <clears throat> actually, believe it or not, Capaldi says that in uh, the episode where he supposedly executes Missy in his third season. And if you actually listen really closely, when Clara tries to pretend she's the doctor to fool the Cybermen and fails at it as usual, as per usual, she does mention that she that her Pridonian, uh, well, or rather the doctor's Pridonian uh, privileges privileges were revoked when she, meaning he, stole a Type Forty TARDIS from Gallifrey. So, oh, clever. Yeah, and honestly, going back to the man himself for a second. Rassilon, he was very was a very vain time lord. He we re really wanted uh, that his chapter, the Pridonian chapter, be the only chapter worth remembering, and he really did put a lot of uh, steps into motion to make sure that not only the, the his legacy will remember will be remembered for the entire history of the universe, but also that that after he's gone, Gallifrey will continue to be the most dominant power in the entire universe. Are they all Rassilon? Yes. So all why is one why does one on the left look like he's a wax figure? The far left? No, the one after that. The one holding the stick. The the little hand stick. With the mustache? Uh yeah. The one wearing the flat looks like a flat hat. Or no, sorry, it looks like a um, the, the, not, not the one in the red robes, the one beside him in the gold with the gray mustache. That is actually the first time we saw Rassilon on television in The Five Doctors. Oh. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if you watch that, you can kind of tell that they didn't really have a handle on what Rassilon should look like at that yeah, time. Yeah, it was pretty weird. Yeah, he was, he was mainly just used as a face on a screen with no body. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, after um, well, sorry, going back further back a bit, during the still the early days of, of Time Lord Society, uh, Rassilon sort of founded what is known as the Game of Rassilon in an area of, of, of Gallifrey known as the Death Zone, which basically, for lack of a better word, it's basically the Hunger Games. The Time oh. Lords just snatched different alien races from different points of the universe threw them into this death zone and sort of forced them to fight each other to the death to reach the, the dark tower, which is at the center, located at the center of the death zone, where eventually Rassilon would have been buried in the future. Oh, interesting. And obviously Rassilon, Rassilon at the time put a stop to it, but that doesn't mean that other time lords haven't reused that area from time to time, right? You can see right here, the very top of this tower, the dark tower, that is the tomb of Rassilon, where Rassilon was buried and, and uh, sl slept the eternal sleep. And anyone who can brave through the death zone and reach the very top of the tower, they will find the tomb of Rassilon and gain the reward they seek, immortality. Ooh. However, as per usual, Rassilon <laughs> tricked whoever uh, went there and anyone who would uh, presume to gain uh, the power of immortality be immortalized forever as a stone statue decorating his tomb. Ouch. Yeah. Rassilon always has to have the last laugh even till the end. What a dick. <laughs> yeah. Rassilon made your mate. This is Rassilon. again going back, going into some more uh, class. Uh, what? I said Rassilon is the BBC. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Now, again, this is going into some uh, modern series stuff, but eventually Rassilon was revived to be uh, in order to lead the Time Lords during the Time War. Well, like I said, that is like going into some modern series stuff. Should we go ahead and talk about 
Omega. Yes. The other notable figure in Time of Society. Omega, uh, I have his real name written here somewhere. Is there but... a Time Lord named Alpha? No. And there's a reason why he uh, he's called that. I'm getting to that. Okay. His real name is Palix. That's his real name, Palix. And uh, he was uh, Rassilon's buddy back in the early days of Gallifrey before... Um, the uh, before Rassilon sort of took po took power and uh, banished the Pythians, they were there was still sort of a structure on Gallifrey during those uh, early days. A sort of time, a not Time Lord Academy, but a Gallifreyan Academy. And during uh, during that time, uh, Palix. Uh, again, I, I have to consult my notes here because even I can't remember everything. So, uh, okay, this is our, yeah, Omega. Uh, you know what? I'm just wasting time. So basically, in that in that academy, uh, he was uh, given the lowest grade possible uh, for an essay that he did. Can't remember at the moment what it, what it was, but for an essay he, that he did, he got the lowest grade possible. Omega, which, you know, it's the last letter of uh, the Greek alphabet, and he was mocked and ridiculed by his fellow classmates, and they, which who nicknamed him Omega after being the, the first and at the time the only student in the history of the Academy to receive that grade. How bad and, was it? <laughs> yeah. Again, again, I don't remember, but it, it's it was sort of a good theory, but completely impractical. That's what I do remember. But even though he completely hated that uh, nickname from that it was given to him by uh, the other kids, Rassilon, his best friend at the time, told him that he should embrace it mm -hmm. and sort of use it as a way to motivate himself. So he completely ditched his original name, Palix, and went with the, uh, his new name of Omega. Omega eventually uh, graduated from uh, the time the uh, the Gallifreyan Academy. His best friend Rassilon became the war monger that he was and conquered all of Gallifreyan and sort of established the new Rassilon world order of the Time Lords. And Omega, choosing to go in a completely different direction from his friend, turned more into science as opposed to war and uh, aggression. And he became a stellar engineer which, as you can tell by the name, he basically he engineered planets. And one one time he went with his uh, trusted, ward, uh, trusted ward and psychic Vindicarian and tested a, a new stellar manipulator device to sort of create a black hole inside a supernova. But accounts from those times are very, very vague and contradictory because, again... Time Lords rewriting their own history yeah. all the time. No one is really quite sure what happened there. Some some accounts suggest that Rassilon betrayed Omega. Some accounts say that it was Vindicarian that actually did the betraying. Some accounts are saying that actually Omega lost his mind and believed Vindicarian was betraying uh, him. Eventually, uh, it drove Omega to take uh, Vindicarian's hand, cut it off, and place it inside the stellar manipulator as its power source, which then was later given uh, the the manipulator then was given the nickname the Hand of Omega. <laughs> then used that uh, weapon uh, the, that uh, stellar manipulator to create a um, supernova contained inside of a black hole, which then was later given the name the Eye of Harmony, which is what gave the uh, Time Lords at the time, the ability to travel through time, giving them mastery over time as well as space. Ooh. Now, unfortunately for Omega himself, the uh, experiment did not go quite as well for him. He got sucked in and thrown into a different universe, a universe of antimatter, where he went completely insane and, and completely lost uh, his physical form, remaining n nothing but a mere shell of the person he used to be hmm. prior to that. That sucks. Now, we talked about Rassilon. We talked about Omega. Should we talk about 
the other. Yes. Unfortunately, there really, really isn't a lot to talk about. He is easily by far the most mysterious mm -hmm. figure out of the three. Case in point, no one even knows his real name. It's just known as the other. No one knows who he really is or was. He just a mysterious figure that randomly shows up throughout Time Lord history. Supposedly, he gave Rassilon the idea of um, dimensional tra transdimensional engineering, which then le led to certain objects being bigger on the inside than they are on the outside, which, of course, led to TARDISes and the way the, uh, the Time Lord uh, architecture is built. Of supposedly, he gave Rassilon the, the ability to regenerate. Supposedly, he showed uh, Omega how to uh, travel through time. No one will, not, there's really not that much information known about the other. However, one thing that is vaguely known about this character is that he pretty much built all of Time Lord society on his back and had a biological offspring, a granddaughter named Susan. Yep. This runs like, hold on a second, because I'd heard a theory that people think the other is none other than the doctor. Yeah, you keep uh, skipping ahead. I'm sorry. I'm like, yeah, I, I, you know what? It's cool to just re-say, I know this one. <laughs> yeah, but but do you know the full story? I, I don't. I just I, know it's a theory I'd read in passing. Yeah, but, but because at one point or another, the other really got on, on Rassilon's nerves, so he told his granddaughter Susan to leave Gallifrey and wait for him on the nearby planet of Tesserus for him to pick her up later. Meanwhile, uh, uh, the other had one final uh, blow to, to, to strike against Rassilon's regime. He threw himself into the looms themselves, completely disintegrating and uh, adding his biological data into the looms, only to be re rewoven thousands, if not millions and millions of years later into... The first doctor, and so once when the first doctor st initially stole a TARDIS and tr accidentally traveled into the planet Tesserus on Ga in Gallifrey's long distant past, he he met Susan, who instantly immediately recognized him as her granddaughter. And even though the doctor at the time had not yet seen her for the first time, he somehow knew he felt it inside his bones that this is. This is right, that this is his proper granddaughter. So he took her back with him to Gallifrey's long distant future from her point of view, his present from, her, from his point of view. And then eventually, sometime later, they, they, they then decided to leave Gallifrey in a stolen Type 40 TARDIS and travel the universe together. And the rest, as they say, is history. Okay, yeah. I, I actually like that. If that was ever made official, I would love that. Speaking of things that were never made official, do you know what this is? Um, I want to say Time Lord writing. Well, yeah, but what is it? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's an. Uh, I'm gonna say a name. It's the Doctor's name. Oh, so Desix too? Pretty much. <laughs> uh. A couple of other things I want to point out. Uh, this is obviously the the seal of the High Council of Time Lords. I just uploaded a bunch of pictures I didn't really know what to do with. But yeah, this is originally... That would be a cool tattoo. Yeah, it, it, it would be. But here's the weird part. This symbol originally de debuted in Tom Baker's first season as a symbol for a completely different species. But I guess someone in the production team liked it a lot. Yeah. So he just said... So you know what? Forget about those guys. That's the symbol for the Time Lords. It's very yin-yang like. You should see the other species that was that was originally uh this symbol was originally given to. And obviously, and then obviously a lot of retcon stuff is like, no, no, the Time Lords sort of gave them a lot of stuff. That's why this symbol appears all over their city. But you know, there's only so much that Redcon can do. But uh one final thing I wanted to bring up. And now I'm just noticing that I'm missing one of the pictures. But this is basically a Time Lord court of law. And uh, the person right in the middle uh, there, that is the Inquisitor. Who basically, she is like the, the judge. Yeah. Of the Time Lord 
court of law. Obviously, the uh, the inquisitor's job is mainly to uh, uh, uphold what? Inquire. <laughs> yeah, to inquire to uphold uh, Gallifreyan laws and values, and uh, the main the the rest of uh, Gallifreyan sorry Time Lord society is uh, mainly comprised of uh, the president of the High Council, uh, the president's chancellor, which sort of acts as a vice president to the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the, the main president. There's also the Castellan, who is in charge of security, primarily the security of uh, the the capital. There's all these other Castellans that sort of uh, uphold security in their own individual sectors. But it's always the grand, the main Castellan who's in charge of of all the other Castellans and all the other guards cha and Chancellery guards mm -hmm. in uh, an object in itself, which is where the uh, the High Council themselves uh, reside. And obviously, that when we mentioned uh, the Southern Intervention Agency, there's really so much we can talk about Gallifrey. There's a reason why I decided to break down this 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 planet over an entire month, and we're going to have so much time, more time to talk about him. Obviously, unfortunately, uh, while Gallifrey has a lot of rich history in expanded media and a lot of great appearances all throughout the classic series, in the modern series, they pretty much opened with. Just saying that, oh no, 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 get, there is no Gallifrey anymore. Gallifrey was destroyed in a great war between the Time Lords and the Daleks. But that is a story for another time. Yeah, so do you have any further questions about any of the topics we talked about today? Uh, none, but I'm definitely looking forward to doing the modern stuff because there's, uh, there's uh, at least I can contribute Actually, more to the conversation there. <laughs> But yeah. uh, no, it's uh, like watching watching the serial for the first time. It really got me interested in the Time Lords a little more because I always knew them as jerks, <laughs> more or less. Um, but there definitely were a few characters in the Deadly Assassin that I do hope, especially one that I do hope we see again. Do you want? Do you want to I can't remember. Okay, I, if, if I'm being honest, I don't remember all their names. Um, but he was the one that. Um, Oh God! Hold on, I'm gonna have to take a look at that. I don't remember his name, but he was the the one the the Time Lord that was like always was the nicest to the Doctor. Was always the one that was the, um, Frick, what's his name? He was the old 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 guy, the oldest one. Uh, Coordinator Engen. I think so. The one in black. The one. Yeah, the one in black. black. When when they're saying goodbye at the end, he's the one that says and goodbye, my uh, yeah, goodbye, my Engen. Yeah, that guy. I liked him. I hope he comes back. Don't get your hopes up. Ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so if, that, if that's really all uh, I have to say, then uh, all I can say is uh, when you get a, a chance to go back, make sure to watch um, The Invasion of Time because, again, I just I just rewatched it to prepare myself for more stuff about uh, today's episode. It's really good. It's really, really good, but uh, yeah. So, Mister, so I don't know if I'll, I, I don't know if I truly have it in me to do all of it, but I really would like you to send me the list of any series I, I you highly recommend I watch because I like The Deadly Assassin. I, I think we can do what I generally do with Snark is whenever I have him on an episode, he just asks for a list of specific ones yeah. that pertain to that topic that we're about to talk about. Maybe we'll just do that. I like that. So that way, yeah, that way I can watch what I need to. And I can, yeah, I like that. Because like I said, I like the Deadly Assassin. I'm definitely looking forward to the Invasion of Time. Um, yeah. All right. So, Mr. Sodov House Canadia. <laughs> where, where can uh, the, uh, the mortals of planet Earth find you? Uh, my personal Instagram at soda underscore the underscore saxman. Um, Friday nights on the Blokes of Wrestling over in LGR, and Thursday nights on Mind and 50's new show, Fun with Flags, where uh, the upcoming episode is I uh, tell 50 a little bit about the crazy history of the Stanley Cup. Yeah, and what a crazy history it was. Probably not as crazy as the history of Gallifrey, but definitely, but definitely a lot more fun. I'll say that. A lot more fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, as for me, as you as uh, sort of mentioned, Fun with Flags, on did we decide on a day uh i well, what i did was i i i just dropped it on thursday on the old um 
our, our show I used to do with Ben. Uh, rewind? Rewind the Yeah, rewind. Okay, so every Thursday then? Every Thursday, rewind the tape, yeah. Okay, so every Thursday, me and Soda, Fun with Flags, uh, talk, talk about our own personal individual countries, one country at, at a time. And every Monday, obviously, on this show, the greatest show in the galaxy, uh, I will be on uh, Taco's um, Geek Gauntlet later this month. So, so will uh, I. I'll see you there. Oh, cool. Cool. With me I, today, I, yeah. I wasn't sure. He, he did say there was uh, a roster change up. So I wasn't sure if you were invited. No, he but, concurred yeah. with me today. The, but cool. then I'll be there. Cool, 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 cool. So the two of us will be on the Geek Gauntlet uh, later this month. And I can also be found on my YouTube channel, 50 Shades of Geek, where I do weekly reviews of Doctor Who episodes from 1963. All the other 2022. Yeah, and yes, I am actually that guy that watched all of it. And yep. now I'm watching it again to review them all on my channel. And uh, I do all the stuff on my channel whenever I have the time to. So thank you for, uh, for joining me today, Soda. Looking forward to doing this again next week. Thank you for watching if you have. And uh, let us know in the comments what you think about Gallifrey and why the Time Lords are all pieces of shit. So... Uh, thank you for watching, and until the next time, everybody. Uh... Allons-y. No, 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 not Allons-y. Where's the? Where's my? Yes. Yeah. The, go, go, and seek the key of Rastalon. Goodbye. <laughs>